Welcome to a series of videos on the Gramus square, also known as the semiotic square. And in this first video, I just want to give you a sense of the basic model. What are the components of the square? And then in future videos, we'll talk also about how to use it, uh, what some of the limitations are, and so on. Now, for this series, I'm focusing on this classic article by Gramus and Rastier, The Interaction of Semiotic Constraints. This is where most people agree the Gramus square was first really explained fully, in a sense. Um, it's the classic description, so that's what we'll focus on here. Okay, so let's start drawing a square. And we're going to start with a simple letter here, so we'll call this S. And S in this case is going to start for the semantic universe, semantic universe. We can have any number of semantic universes. Uh, so it's not as if this is describing all of reality necessarily. It's, de it's describing one angle on reality. And the terms within this semantic universe have to add up to something. They, they create a closed system. Okay, uh, we can even talk about a kind of ideological closure. So the, the terms have to, in a sense, cover the field of this semantic universe. So we're going to talk about smaller units of meaning then within this semantic universe. And the term for a smaller unit of meaning is a seam. So a seam. Think of a seam as something like a molecule or an atom. It's a small unit of meaning within this semantic universe. So we'll have two seams here, and these are contrasting seams. So we have S1 and S2. Okay. Um, and what you typically do with a Gramus square is you start with a binary opposition. So a binary opposition. Two terms that are opposed. And part of the, the purpose of the Gramus square is that once you have this binary opposition, you can deepen it, you can open it up. And that's going to really help you study such things as myth and folklore and culture and literature and film and, and all the rest of those uh, fields. Now, in this case, we're going to start with the example of life and its opposite death. Okay, that's our binary opposition. And both of these are covered then in this larger semantic universe. There's some technical terms that Gramus uses for this. Uh, and when he talks about this, he refers to life and death as hyponyms. So these are hyponyms. And to give an example of this, uh, let's say you talk about different birds. You could talk about crows. And you could talk about pigeons and the list goes on, we can link these back to a larger term, in this case, birds, right, birds. And in this case, hyponyms, these are these, these kind of um, equal terms that fall under a larger category. So we would say that the hyponym is a term whose semantic field, whose field of meaning, is included in another word or another term. And this other term is called the hypernym. All right, so some technical jargon there. It's not hugely important, but it gives you a sense of how life and death relate back to the larger uh, semantic universe. So we haven't finished our square yet. We've got two corners of it, but we need the other two corners. And to create those, we're going to take um, the opposite of these two terms, or at, at least the contradiction of these two terms. So the, uh, the, the, the opposite, the contradiction of death would be not death. Okay, not death. And we're going to call this S2, but we're going to put a line over the S to show that this is a negation. And in fact, this bottom part of the square can be designated as negative S. This is the negative side of the square. Then we're going to take S1 and draw it over here, put a line over it as well, and we're going to call this not life. And you might say, well, this bottom side seems kind of use useless. It's just the absence of something. Uh, but it actually does open things up considerably, as we'll see. The next thing we can do is talk about the relationships between these terms. And in general, the relationship here is disjunctive. Okay, The other term that 
Ramus uses is conjunctive. So when terms work together in a sense, they add up, um, they can be conjunctive, but here the relationships are disjunctive. They clash with each other. So the first relationship here, and we're going to draw a dotted line here, is between life and death. And this relationship is what Gramus calls contrary. Contrary. And the same relationship is between the two bottom terms as well. Okay, these are called contraries. Contrary. Then we have the diagonal relationship. We'll use a straight line for this, or a, a non-dotted line, I suppose. And he calls this contradictory. So when you draw a Gramus square, you're supposed to take the contrary and the contradictory. Those are the, the different disjunctive uh, relationships that we have to be able to figure out. Now the neat thing is that if you have just one term, let's say S1, you have life, you should be able to draw the, the three other corners of the Gramus square because you simply work through the contrary and the contradictory. Okay, so that's our basic square. Um, the next thing is that he, that Gramus and Rastier, they assign some terms to these different relationships. So first of all, at the very top, we have what's called the complex axis. The complex axis. And at the bottom, we have the neutral axis. Okay, so when we talk about an axis, we're talking about this horizontal relationship. The two diagonal lines, these are called schemas. And the first one here, and I'll try right on an angle, uh, this is schema one. So the second one then is schema two. Schema two. Uh, so again, we can talk about the two schemas. And the interesting thing here is that they are, they are contradictories, uh, contradictory to each other as well. So death and not death, schema two contradicts schema one, life and not life. The last relationship is what's called deixis or deixis, depending on where you live and how you pronounce this. So deixis one is on the left side, and it's the relationship between life and not death. And then as you can guess, deixis two is gonna be over here. Okay, that's deixis two. Uh, between death and not life. To describe this relationship, Gramus uses the term implication. Implication. And what he means by that uh, is obviously that the one term implies the other. But I think a, a clear way to, th to, to think about this is by using something like a Venn diagram. So if we take a circle and we put in it S2, not death, okay, there we go, not death. Then the other concept, S1, exists within this. So life in this case is a smaller circle within the larger circle of not death. And in fact, S1 can be defined by, uh, by the larger term. So we could say life to be alive is to be not dead but it doesn't necessarily work the other way around, okay? Because life, in a sense, is a more specific, smaller concept. Um, the same thing can be said for the other side. So if we look over here, we would say that not life, not life is the larger concept, and death is the smaller concept. That's pretty much it for the Gramus square in terms of the basic model. But I'd like to end with one more example, for good measure, uh, and a few final observations. So in this example, we have traffic lights, particularly European traffic lights, as we'll find out. We have a green light, which means go, obviously. And then the opposite would be a red light, which means stop. Now, what I've indicated here is that these top rules, they're, they're all examples of injunctions right? So an injunction is kind of like a command. It's an order. 
Um, it's something you get to do. And these are the positive rules of the system. Whereas on the bottom, we have non-injunctions. It's almost like an absence of rules. So there are two types of rules then. We can have prescriptions, which kind of say you, you, you should do this, you have to do this, um, you get to do this. And then interdictions, these are things that are forbidden. They might, they might even be taboo. So those are the two kinds of injunctions that we tend to find. And Grema suggests that uh, when we create these squares, we place our prescriptions on the left and our interdictions on the right. And that's important uh, because eventually we're going to get to the stage where we start comparing multiple squares at the same time. And so we need to start creating some basic patterns and rules for how we put these squares together. If you look at the bottom, what, what's kind of fascinating here is that we have two orange lights. And this, as mentioned, is very much a European thing. So the, uh, the orange light on the right side here, that's the one that we tend to be used to if we're in North America. That's the orange one that comes after a green light. And it kind of says, watch out, there's a red light coming, right? So you can see it over here. There's a red light coming, slow down, uh, it's closer to an interdiction. It's time to, to start uh, stopping here. By contrast, the, the orange one over here is one that comes um, after a red light. And it's kind of saying, hey, there's a green light coming. It's almost time to get going again. So this one is closer to an injunction. But both of these are really in between signs. And they're non interdictions. They're non prescriptions. So that's the last bit then, uh, and in the next video we'll really start talking about how to compare, as mentioned, multiple um, squares and how you can then use those to analyze particular texts or uh, social and cultural phenomena. Uh, and hopefully as we dig into this in more detail, you'll, you'll find that the gray mass square can be very useful uh, for your own field as well.